Hello everyone, Miss Natalie here. Welcome to Book Bites, where we'll be tasting some juvenile fiction titles that you can download for free on Hoopla using your Cedar Grove Library card. Let's see what we're reading today. Our first book today is Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky by Kwame Mbalia. Chapter One, The Car Ride. There was a rhythm in my fists. Pop, pop. It told a story. Pop, pop. Everybody thought they knew the story. They'd seen it before. He'll get over it. It's a phase. Give him space. But they only knew fragments. They didn't want to hear the rest. Oh, you do? Hmm. Well, what if I told you that I went to war over my dead best friend's glowing journal? Or that I battled monsters big and small with powers I didn't know I had with gods I didn't know existed? Would you believe me? Nah, you wouldn't. You've got your own problems. You don't want to hear about my struggles, right? Oh, you do? Well, I gotta warn you, it's a wild ride, so buckle up, champ. Let me give you some truth, and I hope it returns back to me. Tristan, they're here! Pop. Mom's shout interrupted my groove. I stopped pummeling the small punching bag Dad had installed in my room and loosened the straps on my boxing gloves with my teeth. The gloves fell on the bed, and I dropped down next to them. Eddie's journal sat on my tiny desk in the opposite corner, still glowing, still unopened since his mother had given it to me after the funeral two weeks ago. My room was so small I could have reached out and grabbed the leather book, but that would mean dealing with it, and who wants to deal with their problems by choice? <laughs> Not me. Tristan Strong, my dad yelled from down the hall. I hated that name. It made me appear to be something I'm not. My name should have been Tristan Coward or Tristan Failure or Tristan Fake. Maybe Tristan, how could you lose your first boxing match? Anything but Tristan Strong. Mom's footsteps echoed through our tiny apartment and then soft knocking sounded on my door. Tristan, baby, did you hear me? <clears throat> I cleared my throat. Yeah, I'm coming. The door opened and mom peeked in. She was still wearing the Team Strong t-shirt from last night. I don't think any of us had gotten much sleep after we came back from my first bout. I stayed up nursing my pride, the only thing I really injured. My little fan club, dad, mom, and my grandparents on dad's side had tried to cheer me up, but I could see the disappointment written on everyone's faces, so I pretended to go to bed while they held whispered discussions into the wee hours of the morning. And now it was dawn. Time to get this show on the road. Mom's eyes took in the organized chaos of my room and crinkled when they landed on me. She crossed the floor in two steps, avoiding yesterday's untouched dinner in the process, and sat down on the mattress. It's only for a month, she said, not even play acting that she didn't know what was wrong. I know. It'll be good for you to get away. I know... She rubbed my head, then pulled me into a hug. The grief counselor said it would be good to get a change of scenery. Some fresh air, work around the farm. Who knows? Maybe you'll find out you were meant to work the land. I shrugged. The only thing I was sure of was that I wasn't meant to be a boxer, despite what Dad and Granddad thought. I pulled free of Mom's hug, stood, grabbed my duffel bag, and headed out to start my month of exile. Aren't you forgetting something? Mom asked. I turned and she held Eddie's journal out to me. Her hand and wrist were bathed in the emerald green glow that was coming from the cover. But like everyone else I'd shown the journal to, she didn't notice any strange light. Mom mistook my confused frown for apprehension as she slipped the book into my bag. He wanted you to have it, Tristan. I know it's tough, but... Try to read it when you can, okay? I didn't trust myself to speak, so I nodded and headed to the front door. The decision to ship me to Granddad and Nana Strong's farm down in Alabama had been made without my input. Typical. 
My parents had talked about it a few times before, but after Eddie's death and my third school fight in the final two weeks before the summer break, well, I guess the time was right. At least I'd held my own in those school fights, unlike in the ring last night. It was just my luck that my grandfather had been there to witness my humiliation. You outweighed that kid by seven pounds, Granddad had said after the match in his growling rasp of a voice. Set the family name back by a decade. That's me, Tristan Disappointment. Son of Alvin Wrecking Ball Strong, the best middleweight boxer to come out of Chicago in nearly 20 years, I had Dad's height and Granddad's chin, and boxing was supposed to run in my veins. I'd worn Granddad's old trunks, and Dad had worked my corner. The strong legacy was expected to take another leap forward during my first match. Instead, it got knocked flat on its butt. Twice. You'll get him next time, was all Dad said. But I, couldn't, I could tell he was let down. And that hurt almost as much as getting punched. An early summer heat wave greeted me with a blast of humidity as I left the apartment building with my backpack over my shoulder and my duffel bag in my hand. Thick gray clouds huddled in the distance, and I added that to the list of totally not ominous things. Glowing journal? Yep. Storm on the horizon? You betcha. Dad and Granddad stood at the curb while Nana, no one ever called her grandma, not if he wanted to eat, knitted in the car. Dad towered over his father, but you could see the family resemblance. Deep brown skin like mine, a wide jaw, and a proud stance. I got my hair from Mom's side of the family, thankfully, because both strong men had identical bald spots peeking through their short afros. Get him in the field. Put him to work, Granddad was saying. That'll put some fire in his belly. Dad shrugged and said nothing. To be fair, no one did much talking when Granddad was around. That old man could yak a mile a minute. Nana saw me coming down the stairs, dropped her knitting, and rushed out of the car. There he is. How you doing today, baby? Are you sore from last night? She gave me a hug that muffled any answer, then shooed Granddad to the side. Get the boy's bag, Walter. Alvin, she said, addressing my father. We've got to hit the road before that thunderstorm hits. Granddad looked me up and down. Is that all you kids ever wear? I glanced down. Black Chuck Taylors with gray untied laces, loose khaki cargo shorts, and an even looser gray hoodie. That hoodie went with me everywhere. It had a picture of a flecked bicep on the back in faded black ink. Call me sentimental, but it's what I always wore when Eddie and I were hanging out. He called it the Tristan Strong uniform of choice, perfect for all occasions. So, yeah, I wear it a lot. Nana shushed him and pulled me into another hug. Don't listen to him, Tristan. I can't wait to have you back with us on the farm. You were so little last time, but them chickens you used to chase, you still haven't forgotten you. I packed a lunch and even rustled up a new story or two for the ride. And so, just like that, with a clap on the shoulder from Dad and a hug from Mom, I was someone else's problem for a month. Goodbye, Chicago, and... All your glorious cable TV, internet, and cell phone service. I hardly knew ye. One thing became very clear during the 12-hour car ride to Alabama. I was never going to do this again. Never, ever. Sitting in an enclosed space with Granddad was like wiping your tears with sandpaper. Painful. Excruciating, even. And you wondered why you ever thought it was a good idea. Oh, think I'm playing? Ten minutes into the trip. When I was your age, I had a full-time job and I'd already fought in two title fights. Three hours in. Oh, you're hungry again? Did you bring some stopping for snacks money? Six hours in. Man, I shouldn't have eat those, ate those leftover beans for breakfast. Eight hours in. Can't believe I drove all this way to see a strong boy fight so soft. That's your grandmother's side of the family. Ain't no strong ever looked like that in the ring. Why, I remember... Anyway, you get it. 
By the time we crossed the Alabama state line, I was ready to claw my way into the trunk. I don't know how Nana could just sit there and hum and knit for most of a day, but that's what she did. The Cadillac rumbled down the two-lane highway, kicking up trails of dust and exhaust, a dented rocket ship blasting through time in reverse from the future to a land that Wi-Fi forgot. I put my earbuds in somewhere back in Kentucky, but the battery on my phone had long since run out. I just kept them in so no one would bother me. Nana kept knitting in the passenger seat, and Granddad tapped a finger on the steering wheel, humming along to a song only he could hear. Things seemed more or less calm, except for one thing. Eddie's journal sat on the seat next to me. Now, I could have sworn I'd stuffed the book under the clothes in my duffel bag, which Granddad had put in the trunk. And yet, here it was, waiting on me to do something I'd put off since the funeral. The late afternoon sun, occasionally peeking out from behind the storm clouds, made the journal look normal, ordinary. But every so often, I'd shade the cover with my hands and peek at it while holding my breath. Yep, still glowing. Why not open it, you might ask, and see what's inside? Well, believe me, it wasn't that simple. Before Eddie's death, the cover of his brown leather journal had always been blank. Now a weird symbol appeared to be stitched into it, like a sun with rays that stretched out to infinity or a flower with long petals. The same symbol was embossed on a carved wooden charm that dangled from a cord attached to the journal spine. I'd seen the tassel before. Eddie had used it to mark his spot or to flick me in the back of the head but the charm was new. And even more weirdly, the trinket pulsed with green light too. I'd been staring at that book every day for minutes on end, but the glow always stopped me from opening it. I mean, I knew what was in there anyway. The stories Eddie had jotted down in his goofy, blocky handwriting from his own silly creations to the fables Nana used to tell us when we were younger, when she'd come up to visit. John Henry... Anansi the Spider, Br'er Rabbit's Adventures, I'd read them all. Our end of semester English project was supposed to be a giant collection of stories from our childhood. Eddie was doing the writing and I was going to give the oral presentation. And then the accident happened. The counselor mom took me to every Wednesday had said I should try to finish the writing part, even though school was now over for the year as part of healing and other stuff. Before you say something slick you might regret, Mr. Richardson is pretty cool for a counselor, you get me? We play Madden while we talk, which means I can focus on running up the score on his raggedy eagle squad and not on being embarrassed about answering questions. It helps, some. If it gets too tough, he knows when to back off, too. So you can keep your sensitive and man-up comments to yourself, chumps. To avoid thinking about the haunted journal, I watched the weather outside the car window. The clouds had never let up, even once we were, we were in the deep south. They just switched from hurling lightning bolts at us to hurling fat drops of rain that splattered across the windshield like bugs. Everything everywhere was miserable, and that pretty much summed up my life at the moment. I took off the earbuds and sighed. Nana heard and turned around in her seat to look at me. You hungry, sweetie? She asked. No, not really. No, ma'am. Granddad's deep voice rolled back from the driver's seat. You answer no, ma'am to your grandmother. Understand? Yeah. Granddad looked at me in the rearview mirror. I mean, yes, sir. He held my eyes a moment longer, then went back to looking at the road. Well... Nana continued, turning around and picking up her knitting. Despite what your granddad said earlier, she gave him a glare. Let me know when you are. Your mama told me you ain't been eating much, and we're going to fix that. And don't you have some writing to do? That's what your counselor wants you to focus on. Boy don't need no counselor, granddad rumbled. He needs to work. Ain't no time for moping when horses need feeding and fences need mending. Walter! Nana scolded. He needs to. I know what he needs. I shook my head and stopped paying attention. 
After spending a day in the car with them, I'd realized that this was what they did. They argued, they laughed, they sang, they argued again, and they knitted. Well, Nana knitted. But they were two sides of the same old coin. With Granddad, everything was about work. Work, work, work. Bored? Here's some work. Finished working? Here's more work. Need someone to talk to? Obviously, that meant you didn't work hard enough, so know what? Have a little bit more work. Nana, on the other hand, sang and hummed when she wasn't talking, which almost never happened because she always had a new story to share. Do you know why the owl can't sleep? She'd say, and off the story would go, and you'd sit there and listen, just being polite at first, but by the end, you'd be on the edge of your seat. I smiled. Eddie had loved listening to my grandmother. When she'd come to visit earlier this year, he'd practically followed her around, his journal in hand. Speaking of which, my left hand rested on top of it in the seat next to me, and I traced the symbol stitched into the front cover. What's that, sweetie? I looked up to see Nana peeking over the back seat. Hmm? I mean, uh, yes, ma'am? Granddad nodded, and I let out a sigh of relief. Nana smiled. Is that for your writing? I hesitated. Yes, ma'am. I held up the book so she could see it, and her eyes widened at the symbol on the cover. Where'd you get that? She asked. Granddad turned to see what she was looking at, but Nana flapped a hand at him. Watch the road, Walter. From Eddie, I began, then paused. I mean, his mom gave it to me. It is, was, for us, for our school project. Why? What's wrong? Could she see it? Could she tell that the book was glowing even in the daylight? Nana pursed her lips. That symbol... I just haven't seen it in a long time. You know what it is? Well, she glanced at Granddad, who tuned us out as soon as we started talking about writing. It's the spider's web, an old African symbol for creativity and wisdom. It shows how tangled and complicated life can be, but with a little imaginative thinking, we can solve most of our problems and those of others. Do you notice anything else about the journal? I asked her. Nana laughed, a bright, joyous sound that infected anyone listening. Is this a test? No, ma'am. I don't see nothing but procrastination. Go ahead and give it a try. Yes, ma'am, I frowned. So Nana could see the symbol, the spider web, but not that it was glowing. Well... That didn't make me feel any better. Granddad smacked the steering wheel. Y'all need to stop filling his head with that mess about symbols. He needs to stay in the real world. Think about what he did wrong last night. That boy need to focus. Boxing ain't just gonna happen. You gotta train your body and your mind. Granddad, I don't want... I don't want to hear it. You're not a kid anymore. You're a strong and... Walter... Nana interrupted. Don't be so hard on the boy. He needs some toughening up. Y'all being too soft on him. Now look. Nana started whisper lecturing Granddad, who shook his head and grumbled beneath his breath. I slid down in my seat and tried to block out the argument. I let my thumb trace the cover of the journal. And before my brain could tell me not to, I yanked it into my lap and flipped to a random page. So what if it glowed? It was still a book, and reading it would be better than listening to any more Granddad's insults disguised as life lessons, or reliving that bus accident. I mean, really. What could go wrong? That was Chapter 1 of Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky by Kwame Ambalia. To find out what happens to Tristan next, continue reading his story on Hoopla. Our next book is Sideways Stories from Wayside School by Lewis Sacker. Chapter 1. Mrs. Gorf. Mrs. Gorf had a long tongue and pointed ears. She was the meanest teacher in Wayside School. She taught the class on the 30th story. 
If you children are bad, she warned, or if you answer a problem wrong, I'll wiggle my ears, stick out my tongue, and turn you into apples. Mrs. Gorf didn't like children, but she loved apples. Joe couldn't add. He couldn't even count. But he knew that if he answered a problem wrong, he would be turned into an apple. So he copied from John. He didn't like to cheat, but Mrs. Gorf had never taught him how to add. One day, Mrs. Gorf caught Joe copying John's paper. She wiggled her ears, first her right one, then her left, stuck out her tongue, and turned Joe into an apple. Then she turned John into an apple for letting Joe cheat. Hey, that isn't fair, said Todd. John was only trying to help a friend. Mrs. Gorf wiggled her ears, first her right one, then her left, stuck out her tongue, and turned Todd into an apple. Does anybody else have an opinion? she asked. Nobody said a word. Mrs. Gorf laughed and placed the three apples on her desk. Stephen started to cry. He couldn't help it. He was scared. I do not allow crying in the classroom, said Mrs. Gorf. She wiggled her ears, first her right one, then her left, stuck out her tongue, and turned Stephen into an apple. For the rest of the day, the children were absolutely quiet, and when they went home, they were too scared even to talk to their parents. But Joe, John, Todd, and Stephen couldn't go home. Mrs. Gorf just left them on her desk. They were able to talk to each other, but they didn't have much to say. Their parents were very worried. They didn't know where their children were. Nobody seemed to know. The next day, Kathy was late for school. As soon as she walked in, Mrs. Gorf turned her into an apple. Paul sneezed during class. He was turned into an apple. Nancy said, "'Good bless you,' when Paul sneezed. Mrs. Gorf wiggled her ears, first her right one, then her left, stuck out her tongue, and turned Nancy into an apple. Terrence fell out of his chair. He was turned into an apple. Maritza tried to run away. She was halfway to the door as Mrs. Gorf's right ear began to wiggle. When she reached the door, Mrs. Gorf's left ear wiggled. Maritza opened the door and had one foot outside when Mrs. Gorf stuck out her tongue. Maritza became an apple. Mrs. Gorf picked up the apple from the floor and put it on her desk with the others. Then a funny thing happened. Mrs. Gorf turned around and fell over a piece of chalk. The three Erics laughed. They were turned into apples. Mrs. Gorf had a dozen apples on her desk. Joe, John, Todd, Stephen, Kathy, Paul, Nancy, Terrence, Maritza, and the three Erics. Eric Fry, Eric Bacon, and Eric Ovens. Lewis, the yard teacher, walked into the classroom. He had missed the children at recess. He had heard that Mrs. Gorf was a mean teacher, so he came up to investigate. He saw the twelve apples on Mrs. Gorf's desk. I must be wrong, he thought. She must be a good teacher. So many children bring her apples. He walked back down to the playground. The next day, a dozen more children were turned into apples. Louis, the yard teacher, came back into the room. He saw 24 apples on Mrs. Gorf's desk. There were only three children left in the class. She must be the best teacher in the world, he thought. By the end of the week, all of the children were apples. Mrs. Gorf was very happy. Now I can go home, she said. I don't have to teach anymore. I won't have to walk up 30 flights of stairs ever again. You're not going anywhere, shouted Todd. He jumped off the desk and bopped Mrs. Gorf on the nose. The rest of the apples followed. Mrs. Gorf fell on the floor. The apples jumped all over her. Stop, she shouted, or I'll turn you into applesauce. But the apples didn't stop, and Mrs. Gorf could do nothing about it. Turn us back into children, Todd demanded. Mrs. Gorf had no choice. She stuck out her tongue, wiggled her ears, this time her left one first, then her right, and turned the apples back into children. All right, said Maritza. 
Let's go get Lewis. He'll know what to do. No, screamed Mrs. Gorf. I'll turn you back into apples. She wiggles her ears, first her right one, then her left, and stuck out her tongue. But Jenny held up a mirror, and Mrs. Gorf turned herself into an apple. The children didn't know what to do. They didn't have a teacher. Even though Mrs. Gorf was mean, they didn't think it was right to leave her as an apple, but none of them knew how to wiggle their ears. Lewis, the yard teacher, walked in. "'Where's Mrs. Gorf?' he asked. Nobody said a word. "'Boy, am I hungry,' said Lewis. "'I don't think Mrs. Gorf would mind if I ate this apple. After all, she always has so many.' He picked up the apple, which was really Mrs. Gorf, shined it up on his shirt, and ate it. That was chapter one of Sideways Stories from Wayside School by Lewis Sacker. To read more of the silliness at Wayside School, continue reading on Hoopla. Thanks for joining me today. You can let me know if you enjoyed these titles by leaving a comment here on Facebook. If you'd like to share any requests for future book bites, or if you need help with Hoopla, you can send me an email at Cheatham at palsplus.org. I look forward to reading with you again next week. And in the meantime, I hope you stay tuned for Movie Bingo.